I'm not a fussy actor. I'm not a difficult actor. I can always get, I can always find it. I can always do it. But I was, I found it so difficult. I couldn't, actually couldn't act. And I, I sort of fell apart a bit. Just looking at that clip reel and thinking about all of your characters, one of the things that strikes me about part of the power of them is the secrets that they either choose to share or that they choose to keep to themselves. I'm wondering, as you're building a performance, is it just as crucial to think about what you will kind of show to the audience as opposed to just what you're going to be holding back? Yeah, I've always thought of characters in some respects as like a sort of advent calendar, which you have here, don't you? Um, with all those little closed windows, which you're allowed to open one every day and see the life within a house. And I, 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 I've, I, I prefer to do that, to keep, to keep the audience looking forward to the next moment where they might learn something else or they might not. Um, after all, we don't most of us, anyway, wear our hearts on our sleeves. We keep things covered for those who are very special. And um, I think by doing that, by having that uh, approach to, an, to a performance, um, it, it makes the audience more interested. And I think it's truer to life. What's your earliest memory of acting? When I was at prep school, which uh, 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 in England, it lasts from seven till thirteen. Um, I played, I think, when I must have been about twelve, uh, in a Moore's mystery, um, and I played a sort of Agatha Christie type um, uh, um, detective who was a lady, <laughs> <laughs> and she wore tweeds. It was a, it was set on the Moors, I remember. She wore a tweed suit, uh, a rather nice jacket and, and, and a skirt and, um, <laughs> and, and sensible shoes. And just before I went on, the, um, the, uh, the, the director, the mistress who was directing the play, said to me, don't forget to adjust your, shirt, your skirt before you sit down, or when you sit down. And I'd seen the older boys, and I was very envious of them, because we wore shorts. And I'd seen the older boys, before they sat down, hitching up their trousers, trousers <laughs> and they sat down. I thought it was very grown up. I thought, oh, yeah. So every time <laughs> before <laughs> I sat down, I hitched up my skirt. <laughs> and the audience laughed. And it was my first time of having that wonderful drug of, of doing something and having the audience laugh. Yeah. And that was the first thing I ever remember. My earliest memory, of so many of us uh, could probably say the same, of seeing you was, of course, Brideshead Revisited, 1981, which got you a BAFTA nomination. I'm wondering, that was an incredibly successful and influential miniseries. I'm wondering about the success in that, how it did or maybe didn't influence subsequent choices. Did, did you think about the next roles a little differently after Brideshead? No, I, I, I chose to do Bright... Well, I put myself up for Brideshead because I was doing um, theatre in London at the Young Vic and in the West End and the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I was seeing my name up in lights, which is very flattering, but I knew that no one was coming because I was in it because nobody knew who I was. <laughs> and I thought, I have to address this. Uh, and I was trying to make films, but nobody wanted to cast me. They were casting an actor called Simon Ward for all the parts that I would have been right for. He played young Churchill, you might remember. Um, it was much better looking than me and had experience. And so, what? <laughs> A grumbling of dissent, I believe, right. from the <laughs> ladies. And anyway, they, they, were, they wouldn't look at me. And, and so a friend of mine, George Howard, um, came to see a play I was doing in Greenwich. And we were having a drink afterwards, and he said, have you ever read I said, Revisited? And I said, nope. He said, well, you read it. It's a great book. And Granada are going to film it. He knew about it because they wanted to use his house, Castle Howard. Um, and he said, read the book. And you know, so I read the book and, and got in touch with Granada and said, if you're going to make this, I'd love to be involved. And they said, we haven't got a director yet or anything, but we'll be in touch. And they were. And they asked me to play Sebastian. And I said no. By then, I'd fallen in love with Charles, who I thought was the quintessential Englishman, and I thought I could play him better than any other actor I could think of. Whereas I could think of a lot of actors who could play Sebastian. I was, I just, I, I felt Charles needed an actor who would be self-effacing. Uh, like if you throw a great party, uh, what you have to do is to make sure that everybody else has a great time, not that you have a great time. 
and um, Charles actually required almost no acting. And it wasn't until about the fourth month that I started doing something. And the director said, what are you doing? I said, well, I thought I'd, I'd do this. He said, just don't do anything. <laughs> you don't need to do anything. And um, uh, so we made that. And there was a complication because there was a strike. And I had already committed to Carol Rice and said that if you can persuade Hollywood to let this unknown Englishman play in your film, I'll be there. Um, and I said, but I suspect you're going to need a star. Well, he called me in the middle of Bright's Head and said, um, I don't need a star, I've got Meryl Streep, you can play it. Um, <laughs> so, so I said, great. Uh, but then there was a strike at Bright's Head, so there was, there was difficulty in dates. And in effect, in, 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 as it turned out, I made both at the same time. Um, I, we had a layoff from Bright's Head of four months while I went away and did uh, the French Lieutenant's Woman and, and, and then had a break in the middle of the French Lieutenant's Woman because I had to go back. We had booked Oxford, Hartford College, to do the Oxford stuff and that couldn't be shifted. So I had to leave French Lieutenant's Woman, go back and be Charles at Oxford and then go back to Lyme Regis to do the French Lieutenant's Woman. And they both came out at much the same time. French Lieutenant, I was, I was sticking on all the time. I was sticking on bits of facial hair and tearing them off because... Uh, Charles had sideburns, and and uh, Sue Baradell, who um, who did the makeup, was was wonderful. She didn't just stick them on; she laid them on hair by hair by hair. Uh, it took hours, <laughs> and I remember when we did the test uh, for them. We were in my house in Hampstead in London, and Harold Pinter was there because he'd written the script for the French Lieutenant's Woman, and his wife, Lady Antonia Fraser, was also there, and 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 she's one hell of a woman. And she came up to me at one point when they were on, and she looked at it and she said. Oh, she said, that's so good. Did they take the hair from other parts of your body? <laughs> <laughs> Talked about Secret Keepers a couple of moments ago, uh, which brings to mind Damage and Waterland and M. Butterfly, Lolita, all amazing performances. Um, I'm wondering, it, it must be such My a... My wife's in Waterland. She's yes, terribly good. Does anyone see yes. in Waterland? Sorry. Yeah. By Stephen she plays My Wife in it. Mm -hmm. God, that was hard. <laughs> <laughs> It re no, seriously, it yeah. was. Um, she, ca she joined the film quite late because I think Miranda Richardson was originally going to play it. And Miranda dropped out, had to go and do something else. And so Shanaire was cast. And the director, Stephen Gyllenhaal, um, yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal's dad, Stephen said, well, I want you to stay in separate hotels. Um, I said, well, that's fine. So... so <laughs> So we did. But we, the first scene we had to do was when I discover her. For those of you who haven't seen the film, this is boring. But see it, because it's actually good, quite good. Um, it was when I discover her in the bathroom, and she's just given this child back. And she's completely distraught. And I'm her husband. And I found it so emotionally. And now I'm not a fussy actor. I'm not a difficult actor. I can always get. I can always find it. I can always do it. But I was. I found it so difficult. I couldn't. Actually, couldn't act. And I. I sort of fell apart a bit. And Stephen eventually said, "Come on, let's go home." And we went home, and we came and did it the next day. But it was just. You know, when you're playing with your wife, you have so much uh, baggage there anyway, so much stuff you know. And so what we were trying to do by staying in separate hotels was to separate that from... But it's so... You can't do it like that. And, um, and when I saw her in that absolute distress, uh, phew, I, it just stopped me acting. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Went home. It was all right the next day. A terrific but anyway, film, we were yeah. talking about secrets. We talking about secrets, and it must be such a, a gift as a as an actor to have a character, as all four of those terrific films are for you. That that you know something about yourself that the audience won't find out until that final act or those final scenes. It must be such a such a treat and a gift to have characters like this to really sink your teeth into, right? It's funny how many actors don't. I mean, I was we were doing a scene the other day. I was sh shooting a film in Kentucky, and. Um, I, I, I wasn't in it, there was two, two young, th young things in it, and I went and looked at it, and, and, I, and I, I said to them, why are you behaving like that? Somebody knocked at the door, that's right, they were sitting in a motel, someone knocked at the door, it was great, they just made love, 
And I said, it could be room service, it could be me, my character, who's uh, had a place to sort of two doors down in the motel. It could be anybody. You don't have to creep. To in fact, it was somebody, a big surprise for them. And, and things were going to really start moving once that person came into the room. But they didn't know that. And I said, you, you only know what you know at that moment. Play that. Don't play the script. That will happen later. Um, you know, play, play, the, play moment to moment to moment and the reality of that. And, and, and they changed. And it was a lot better, the scene, I have to say. You know, he went to the door like a normal person. Sort of going to the person who was at the door as if there was, he was going to see Dracula on the other side of it. <laughs> Uh, so secrets, yeah, it's great to have secrets as a character. It's great to, to carry secrets. I mean, I love enigmas. I, I, I know a lot of people, and I know none of them completely. They're, they always, however, I mean, I love getting to know people. Uh, that's why I love deep relationships, and the joy of that is, is, that, is unpeeling, is getting to know them, getting to know them more and more and more. Um, but... But, uh, but they always, part of them remains an enigma. Part of everybody else to me is an enigma. And therefore, I try to play characters that have that enigma enigmatic quality. I, I just think it's sort of real to life. Um, and, and great writers, of course, mm -hmm. provide that. Yeah. Um, not only enigma, but inconsistency. It's another thing I love in characters. Shakespeare's brilliant at. People behave inconsistently. We all do. And, and a lot of poor writers write consistent characters and say things like, oh, he wouldn't do that. And, and actors, I sometimes hear in rehearsals, say, oh, he wouldn't do that. And you think, what do you mean he wouldn't do that? People do anything. Yeah. You know, and if he does that, then that makes him a slightly different person because he's done that. So the line through a character needn't be smooth. It's jagged. We all behave oddly at times. Find the reason, find the reason. <laughs>